Good morning. We welcome you to the, to the 2019 Baccalaureate Service of Waynesburg University. All graduates and faculty may remove their caps at this time to receive the invocation. Good morning. It's a joy to gather with you. This is a special family here at Waynesburg University, the class of 2019. And to begin our service, let us open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we gather here this morning as a celebration not only of the accomplishments of this special group of graduates, but of the work that you, O oh Lord, have been doing in their lives. We recognize that this journey has started long before they've arrived at Waynesburg University, and so we give thanks for their family and for their friends, for their mentors, for their coaches, and the many more that have impacted their story. 
And Lord, we know that ultimately you are writing their story. You are God and we are your people. And may we seek to honor you and give you praise in in and through all things. Through our work and through our play, through our friendship and this celebration, may we always point to you, Jesus, giving you all the glory and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The faculty may be seated. The Waynesburg University Lamplighters, led by director Melanie Katana, will offer an anthem. Following the anthem, the audience will remain seated for the litany to be led by our provost, Dr. Dana Baer. The Lamplighters will be singing Palestrina's Latin setting of Psalm 42.1, as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after thee, O Lord. Lord of earth and heaven, your call resounds like a clear, bright trumpet blast. Holy God, you take delight in our gifts and talents offered back to you as a living sacrifice. Faithful Father, you ask us to trust you for the future. Redeemer King, you equip and prepare your people to bear your loving kingdom to a world in need. Lord of hosts, you send forth your spirit to free us, body, mind, and heart, to live with unceasing praise. Lord. 
Lord, we are yours. Draw us near to you. Please join with us in standing and singing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of John in the 18th chapter, verses 33 through 40. Listen now and hear the word of God. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
It is my privilege to welcome the Reverend Dr. James Gilchrist back to our campus. In 2016, Waynesburg University presented Reverend Gilchrist with the A.B. Miller Leadership Award in recognition of his exemplary spiritual and social leadership, and we are honored to have him here again today. A distinguished scholar, inspirational educator, and selfless servant of Christ, Reverend Gilchrist's meaningful impact is evidenced through his life's work as a pastor and an educator. Deeply committed to mission as well as ministry, he has traveled extensively throughout the United States, Latin America, and Europe. Reverend Gilchrist began his own education at Yale University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy and a Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School. He has a Master of Public and International Affairs from the University of Pittsburgh and a Master of Arts in History, as well as a doctoral degree in History and Public Policy, both from Carnegie Mellon University. It is with great pleasure that we welcome an individual whose work parallels Waynesburg University's mission of faith, learning, and serving. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. James Gilchrist. Thank you, President Lee. It's so good to be back here at Waynesburg. I love what you do here, and I'm grateful for the invitation to join you again on this great weekend. And I want to congratulate everyone who graduates today and all the families and friends here to celebrate with you. I'd like to bring a word this morning on a topic that's become oddly controversial in our time, although it shouldn't be, and that is the whole matter of truth and our commitment to it. My nominee for best book title of 2018 is Truth Decay. Sadly, it's not a work of fiction. It was a study put out by RAND, the nonpartisan, not for profit public policy research organization. Truth Decay explores how people not only disagree about what the truth is on various important issues of our time, but fail to distinguish facts from opinions and sometimes even question the reality of objective facts altogether. This is an enormously important issue for both civic and spiritual reasons. Civically, because democracy depends on a citizenship that cares enough to know the truth and to act upon it. And spiritually, because Jesus himself tells us the truth will make you free. I went to a conference on science and religion a few weeks ago. And one of the speakers, a preacher, not a scientist, drew a distinction between dogs and cats in the way they think. He said, a dog sees a human and says, wow, he feeds me, he plays with me, he lets me run around, he gives me everything I want, he must be a god. A cat looks at a human being and says, wow, he feeds me, he plays with me, he lets me run around, lets me do everything I want, gives me everything I need, I must be a god. People with pets may recognize the distinction. Same set of facts, entirely different conclusion, both of them quite mistaken. I went to college pre-med thinking I was going to major in biology and psychology, but wound up with a philosophy major for reasons that I still don't entirely understand. <laughs> but I'm grateful for the experience in retrospect because philosophy teaches you, among other things, how to think clearly. And Thinking clearly is really helpful if you have any commitment at all to the truth. I got the impression from Aristotle, though I may have misread him as a sophomore, sophomores sometimes do that, that human beings are rational animals and that the essential quality of, human of humankind is a capacity for reason and therefore a desire to seek the truth. 45 years or so later, Having read a great deal more and spent my whole life working closely with and observing people, I'm now inclined to think that humans 
like the preacher's dog and cat, tend to see things mostly through the lens of their own biases and come quickly to whatever conclusions they want to believe. A fair portion of humanity seems to be interested in only as much truth as suits their other interests. You may know that the novelist and social critic Upton Sinclair famously said a century ago that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. We might add that for a sizable number of people today, salary depends also on keeping other people from understanding some things. I still remember watching the CEOs of the seven major tobacco countries or companies testify before Congress in the 1990s and how they misrepresented to Congress the addictive and health-damaging qualities of their products, even though their own company documents and the overwhelming evidence of science showed that their testimony was false. Follow the money, as the saying goes, because it will often lead to those who have strong incentives to distort the truth. The temptation to lie, or at least avoid the truth, arises whenever we're afraid of what might happen if the truth were told. And that's such a common tendency that it shows up in the very beginning of the Bible. You know the story. God comes looking for Adam in the Garden of Eden when, for the first time, Adam feels that he needs to hide from God. Who, who told you that you were naked? God asks. Did you... Did you eat of that tree, the fruit of which I commanded you not to eat? And right then and there, right on the spot, Adam twists reason to rationalization. And he says what men have said ever since, the woman, the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. <laughs> and here, there's not one but two accusations in that. Do you hear them? Of course, first, it's the woman's fault. The woman you gave me, she gave it to me. What could I do? I had no choice. Which is what people always say when they want to avoid the truth and avoid the consequences for the decisions, the choices they already made. And by the way, Adam adds implicitly, she was your idea. You gave her to me. I was doing just fine before all this. But now look, this woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit I ate. What could I do? Blame somebody else, blame God even, cherry pick the facts, do whatever you can to avoid the truth if the truth might be troubling. And it really doesn't matter whether you take that story in Genesis literally or as some kind of a parable because it has the ring of truth either way. We're only three chapters into the Bible here. In chapter 1, God creates the whole shebang, the whole universe. In chapter 2, God creates man and woman and the rest of life. And by chapter 3, things already fall apart. Next thing you know, Adam and Eve's son Cain is jealous of his brother, and so he kills him. And once again, God comes looking. Where's, where's your brother Abel? And now Cain answers with a lie wrapped in a cynical evasion. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The whole plot of the Bible. The whole plot of the Bible is that it takes humankind just three pages to make a mess of everything and deny the truth of what they've done and destroy their relationships with God and with one another. And then it takes God the next 1,200 pages or so to clean up the mess. That's essentially the plot of the Bible. So an aversion to truth is hardly new, as Genesis strikingly tells us. But what may be new, or at least magnified in our time, is the notion that we live in a post-truth world. Have you heard that announcement? We live in a post-truth world. There's really no such thing as truth. There are only opinions and points of view. But of course, that's nonsense, isn't it? Nobody really lives like that. We take a thousand things as being true every day. If we didn't, we could never get out of bed or eat our food or do our work or have any sorts of relationships with other people. 
The claim that there's no such thing as truth is just one of those unhinged exaggerations of something else that is true, and that is that some questions are matters of opinion, and some are matters of fact, and the key is to know which are which and to act accordingly. So if a child is learning her numbers and she says two plus two equals five, you would of course correct her because she made a mistake and you want her to learn the way things really are in the world so that she can get along with the way things are. Two plus two is four, not five. That's just a fact. And people need to know facts in order to thrive as individuals and for society as a whole to function. A prominent theme in our time is the pervasive power of tribalism in all its forms. A great many people today seem to value tribe over truth, which is why conflicting judgments about matters of fact on issues ranging from personal behavior to the economy to the environment correlate so strongly with tribal and other partisan interests. The late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan is widely quoted for his saying that people are entitled to their own opinions but not their own facts. And of course, he was not the first person to say that, but the point is vitally important. Some claims are true, some claims are false, no matter who makes them. There is no liberal boiling point of water or a conservative boiling point. It's 100 degrees Celsius at sea level, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Anthropogenic climate change is either real and a problem that demands our attention, or it is not. And that's a question of fact, regardless of what liberals or conservatives choose to believe about it. People may have all sorts of political or economic or social interests in accepting some truths and denying others, but facts are facts whether people believe them or not. Belief and certainty are states of mind. Truth is a state of affairs about the world itself. And everyone who has ever made an honest mistake, and to be a bit presumptuous, I'm assuming it's all of us, anyone who's ever made an honest mistake, let alone intentionally told a lie, knows that even sincerely held belief is not necessarily the same thing as truth. I was on the jury of a murder trial a few years ago where people on the witness stand stood and swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And then several of them proceeded to say things that were manifestly false. If you commit a crime and want to avoid the consequences, the last thing you care about is making sure that the truth comes out. And over the years, I've had people sit in my office and rationalize all sorts of bad behavior for basically the same reason. Because acknowledging the truth would mean they'd have to confess to something that wasn't right. And they'd have to change their ways, but really they'd rather go on living a lie as long as they could get away with it. A band called Fleetwood Mac, that people my age would know, you probably would not, a band named Fleetwood Mac had a song in the late 1980s called Little Lies. And in that song, the